So welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to see you there. I'm always amazed, you know, at this remote meeting when we have someone from Athens, from one from New York, from Turin. It's just amazing. And Eindhoven, of course. So uh, I am Laure Estevny, head of CERN alumni relation. And I'm particularly pleased to introduce first our guest speaker. Before meeting Augusto Secucci, yes, Secucci, recently, I did not know that one could fall in love with particles. <laughs> Augusto fell in love with chaos, and the story apparently is still very much on. <laughs> Spokesman of successively NA48 and NA62, which are studying rare chaos decay. He's now CERN's group leader for small and medium experiments. Thank you so much, Augusto, for sharing with you your, pa your passion for Kaon. Next, ladies first, I am pleased to introduce Eleni, Eleni Tomari, an experimental high energy physicist who did a PhD with the CMS experiment. Today, Eleni teaches physics in Athens and she is an enthusiastic supporter of all CERN alumni initiative. She is also the co-founder of the CERN alumni group in Athens. It's a pleasure to have you there, Eleni. Thank you very our, much, Laura. Our other moderator, Giordano Catani, is joining us from Eindhoven, where he's leading a group of engineers involved in the latest semiconductor technologies for a company called ASML, which is the market leader for photolithography. Giordano did his PhD in high, high energy particle, sorry, high energy physics with Atlas, and he co-founded the Eindhoven Sun Alumni Group. He's also always ready to support us. So a heartfelt welcome to the three of you. And I look forward to Rachel? Or yeah, so but I'm coming between you and these lovely Kaons, but again, also on my side, thanks, Law. I'd like to say thank you as well to um, our wonderful speaker and our marvellous moderators, and thanks to you also for joining us. Now, it would be nice if people could keep their cameras on, because I think Augusto wants to see that moment when you all fall in love with Kaons like he has. Um, but if you could keep your microphones muted, that would be great. Um, and also we have um, 30 minutes of um, presentation with Augusto. And then if it's okay with you, we'll take the questions at the end. Okay, I've spoken enough now. Augusto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you everybody for attending. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll give you a flavor well, uh, about, about these amazing chaos. Now, if you come at CERN, next time you come at CERN, uh, Look for the sign. There's a there's an official road sign at CERN indicating where the Kaon factory is, and with the help of Rachel and Laura, we might might even find it, and we can we can go and visit it together. Uh, let me now go to briefly just a few slides about the past of the Kaons. Now, first of all, what are Kaons? Kaons are strange particles. They typically weight the mass of a Kaon is typically half the mass of a, of a proton. So they are reasonably light. And uh, they have a lifetime of 10 nanoseconds. 10 nanoseconds is 10 billionths of a second, which in, in an elementary particle physics is an extremely long time. Right? So these are long-lived particles. They let you have the time to study them. These are very special. Now, what, uh, what I want to what, use one slide about the great past of, of, of uh, building the, the standard model, what we call the standard model of particle physics with chaos and strange particles. And I will simply go through uh, of, the, of the things that those of you who, who have been particle physicists, who are particle physicists by training, obviously remember. And I'll, I'll try to describe it in, in simpler terms for everyone to understand. So the first is that uh, these chaos carry, they are produced by strong interactions. So, which means you can make many of them striking protons on, on targets. You can make a lot of chaos, but then they decay very slowly. They have a long lifetime. And so 
behind those things that uh, actually led to the to the concept of flavor that is you know the flavor in flavor physics so is the flavor of the quarks we have six six type of flavors divided in three in three uh, generations and another very weird uh, property of the chaos is to turn themselves into from a particle to an antiparticle is if, if the if the particle has no charge, it's a neutral particle. And we call that the K0, K0 bar oscillation. Now that was very, very important to establish the phenomenology of what is called the flavor mix, mixing. Um, there were a lot of paradoxes that were brought up by Keons. And I will actually use one slide to briefly mention the theta tau paradox. Keon, how the name came along at a certain point, Keon is the modern name. It used to be uh, called Vs and, uh, and Theta and Tau, and uh, they, they are very linked to another property uh, of the weak interactions, which is the violation of discrete symmetries like the parity. Now, parity is the operation you make when you look at yourself into the mirror. If you notice your image in the mirror is flipped and uh, and, uh, and left and right has flipped. But uh, apart from that, things should function the same way, except that in, 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 in weak interactions, they don't actually, it's maximally violated. Um, chaos, strange particles to be more correct because they are the hyperons. Uh, where are the base of uh, you know, universality of the weak interaction? That was really the base of the Kabibo theory. And uh, Kabibo theory, it's, it's a pillar of, uh, of weak interactions and allows to describe how all the mixing of the quarks come together. It's really the, 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 the birth in a sense of the flavor physics as we know it. Um, because of the properties of the chaos, in particular, the smallest of the difference of the, uh, of the, of the, of the masses of the neutral chaos and, uh, and very suppressed uh, uh, modes of decay, people had to come up with inventing a fourth quark before being discovered in order to justify the, the features of, of the chaos. That's called the uh, glacio iliopolis mayani mechanism, which is another uh, pillar of, of particle physics. And last but not least, CP violation. In order to understand the CP violation, which was discovered in the chaos and about which I will briefly speak just to complete the historical introduction, people had to come up with six quarks, but only three were actually discovered in order to accommodate inside the, uh, in some way, this phenomenon of, C of, of CP violation into the, uh, the so-called standard model. By now, you have understood one important thing, I believe. I was talking about the standard model, but moving from the beginning of the list to the end of the list, the standard model picked up few, few things. We always call it in the same way, the standard model, because whenever each time we understand something, we add it to the standard model. So to me, in a sense, when we see that the standard model is passing every test, well, you know, the standard model was not always the same, has been growing, incorporating step-by-step step all the new discoveries. So after all, we are continuing to build the standard model. So if, and if we don't break it, we should not be disappointed because we are continuously building it. And the chaos, uh, I am convinced, have not yet, uh, uh, they have not yet been completely exploited. There are still more things that we should be uh, learning from them. Let me now just uh, make you a little bit more familiar with the CP symmetry. I mentioned the theta and the tau decays. The theta decay is a K plus, so it's a charged kaon, decaying into three pions, while the tau is a K plus decaying in two pions. Now, if you look at the, uh, if you would look at the mirror, the three pions, um, in, a, in a sense, they have this quantity called parity minus one, they would look flipped while the tau would have plus one. But the point was that the theta and the tau both had the same mass. How could they be the same particle? Well, they were the same particle because uh, 
uh, they are distinguished uh, because parity is violated in the weak interactions. Now, this came as a shock. This was in the 50s. And the great Russian physicist Landau, 1957, was very concerned about this uh, apparent violation of symmetry of space. And in order to restore it, he combined parity with the charge conjugation, which is the operation of flipping the charges of the, uh, of the, of the, of the particles into the antiparticles. And doing so, leaving the space absolutely symmetric. So uh, you see the cartoon here. If you take a left-handed neutrinos, a neutrino which is as a as a um, as a spin aligned uh, uh, in this way, if you look at the mirror of it, it turns into a right-handed anti-neutrino uh, because the right-handed neutrino does not exist. In order to restore symmetry, you have also to flip the charge. And is the right and the anti neutrino. So, in a sense, to save the symmetry of space in view of parity violation, Landau posited the symmetry of the combined operation of parity and charge conjugation, leading to what is called CP conservation. The process looked at the mirror when you flip the charges should behave precisely in the same way, except that it doesn't. And it was, again, 1964. The four gentlemen in the in the, in the picture here, they uh, basically uh, found that uh, the long-lived neutral kaon, so the kaon that should have uh, only be decaying in uh, in three, the, the, this one here, the K2 with the CP negative, so that is not supposed to decay in two pions. Instead, it does decay in pions. Uh, a tiny amount of it only two per mil, but it's sufficient to establish CP violation. This has been a huge discovery, especially because CP violation is one of the essentially necessary ingredients, this was found out in 67, about explaining the imbalance of matter and antimatter in the universe. So it's something fundamental that has to be understood. For many years, it was completely unclear whether CP violation would be a mysterious phenomenon that would happen exclusively in the Kaon system for reasons like the, small, the smallness of the difference of the mass between the, uh, the two Kaons, the long-lived and the short-lived Kaon. And um, so as soon, as soon as this discovery was made here, so that the K-long can decay into pions, uh, the phenomenology was uh, was, was, was uh, developed by Hu and Yang in 1964. And they basically added a second number to epsilon. Epsilon is the uh, violation of the symmetry in the mixing. They added another one, which is epsilon prime. And they basically led to uh, these two numbers, not just explaining one number, but also two. And this second number, which is called epsilon prime, is uh, parametrizing the, the, the violation of this symmetry, CP symmetry, not in the mixing of the chaos, but in the decay of the chaos. And it turns out, okay, epsilon we have seen is two parts per mil, epsilon prime is much smaller than that, but it turns out that it can be actually measured experimentally. And uh, demonstrated that this epsilon prime quantity is different from zero would lead, would point to the fact that CP violation is not just a process happening because of the weird quantum mechanical properties of mixing, but something related to the decay of a particle. So something that has to be uh, really related to the, to the weak interaction responsible for the disintegration of the chaos. Right, so this is experimental quantity R that is uh, related to epsilon prime over epsilon. And uh, now we are in the 80s, so we made a jump of about 20 years. And there were experiments on both sides of the Atlantic looking for measuring this epsilon prime over epsilon quantity. And um, the first round of experiments was non-conclusive. Direct CP violation was consistent with zero in the US, 
and uh, different from zero, uh, 3.5 standard deviations away from zero, at CERN. This required a new uh, round of the experiments. They were called an A48 at CERN and KTAB at NAL. I will flash now one slide concerning the CERN experiment, the NA48 experiment at CERN. And I will not go through the uh, characteristics of this experiment, but I simply wish to say that um, a key element of this detector, this, this experiment, is shown on the, 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 the inside of the detector, is shown on the right inside here, and is the liquid krypton calorimeter which is intended to measure precisely the neutral particles, the photons, can also measure precisely the electrons. Now, you see this nice structure made of a lot of copper beryllium electrons. This is inside a cryostat. This detector is a cryogenic detector. And I want to say that uh, it is the same, you know, in particle physics, we try to recover everything. And it's still in it's the calorimeter, which is still used now by an A62. And I wish to say that this is that this is called at 120 Kelvin since 1998. The last time we opened the calorimeter, emptied the liquid, and making the maintenance was 1998. Can you can you believe that the scientific instrument is still working and very well, nicely after 22 years? Uh, to me, this is a, is, 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 a, is, a, is a testimonial in the sense that if things, when things are done properly, they can be used for a long, long time to address different types of physics. Now, to make a very long story short and concluding about epsilon prime over epsilon, I will simply say that um, after these four main experiments, uh, there's absolutely no uh, doubt that uh, epsilon prime over epsilon, sorry, here is, is flipped, is epsilon prime over epsilon, not epsilon over epsilon prime, is, is different from zero. And this ruled out weird, super weak models and was a strong endorsement for the explanation of CP violation within the uh, standard model by now, which we call the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa explanation of CP violation. And this was. Uh, um, then uh, confirmed by the discovery of CP violation in the B system, which is now a very, very big uh, branch of studies in flavor physics. So much for epsilon prime over epsilon. And I will now move to the research of NA62, which is rare K on the case. Now, also, there is a long history. We start again from the 60s, and the first people were looking for this type of decays. For instance, a K plus going into a pion net pair of electrons or a pair of muons or a pair of neutrinos, even better, because uh, these things should happen, but they were not there. If you take a normal K on decay, like a K plus to muon neutrino, that happens very frequently about 70% uh, of the times the kaon disintegrates in the muon and neutrino. But if you take the neutral kaon, the limit, as you can see here, was less than a part per million. How is that? That led to the, uh, that was understood in terms of what I mentioned before, the, uh, the G mechanism. So the, the, the point is, these are very, very, you're at least test stressing the standard model looking at this kind of, uh, these integrations, and you're testing diagrams like the diagrams I've shown here. These are basically saying that these decays cannot happen at three levels. So a quark cannot just uh, disintegrate into a, a W and, and another quark, but they have to go through these loops where, which are mediated by very heavy particles like the top quark, or if there are other particles out there beyond the quarks that we know, also those ones. And this is what uh, actually interested us. You can make very precise predictions, test to stress the standard model in corners where you really you know, would say, well, if it's really working even there, then there must be something really special about. 
in trying to, uh, to see experimentally what you find. And um, well, I got interested in this decay in 1991 because I was, I was uh, getting a test study to, to, to be hired by INFN in those years. And they gave me a, 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 an exercise, which was uh, design an experiment to measure K plus to P plus nu bar, 1991. And then I was shocked how to do it. It was a disaster. I mean, I passed, I, was, I got hired, but I certainly still ashamed about what I proposed to do the experiment. But, uh, in, in, and there was a suggestion to do it uh, decay addressed. Actually, somebody did it with the decay addressed, which means with the kaon stopped in the laboratory because a kaon with the charge, with the electric charge, you can, you can slow it in the lab while the neutral one, you cannot. And then you could look at, look, at the, look at the thing. You have a prediction, which is 8.4, 10 to the minus 11. And you have basically nothing to measure because the two neutrinos, the neutrino and the antineutrino go away. There's, there's nothing you can do about. And there was an experiment done in Brookhaven, which found something which was two times the standard model, although with a very, very large error. But this was very intriguing. So that's why we wanted to check that. And that's why actually we, 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 we put together an A62, we proposed it and uh, sold it to CERN as, as a small experiment, which is not, but uh, that's part of uh, particle physics nowadays, if you want to do something which is not uh, just um, general purpose. And so the big question was, is it two times the standard model? Is there something we can, we have to again add to the standard model? And that's a new technology, new technique called an decay in flight. Uh, of course, you know, studying that is not just, you know, okay, we know that such a decay because of these loops, which I've shown here, these loops, a sensitivity beyond the standard model. It talks to three different families of leptons. This neutrino, antineutrino in the final state can be electron, muon, tau neutrino. You see here a model for different parameters related to possible extensions of the standard model going to uh, the third family. You have generic models. So in a sense, there's a lot of motivation, phenomenological and theoretical motivation to study well this decays because they can put stringent bounds on possible extensions of the standard model. Now, this is uh, the NA62 experiment at CERN. is in the underground area in the Prevescent site. You see here, I have put the circle of the LHC in red, the SPS, and the SPS is shooting protons in the so-called north area where NA62 is located. This is an underground area. And um, you can see this is about 200 meter long. You see that it's certainly not a small experiment. It's a big cylinder, evacuated cylinder, uh, surrounded by calorimeters and detectors. And I want to give you a few, a few pictures of it because um, now if you come, if we go together and visit the experiment, we cannot see the detectors anymore because they are all hidden inside the tank, which is a pity because they are very nice as I will show. Um, so the beam comes this way. So the target is somewhere up there. Um, in this large hall, we cannot enter when, uh, when we have uh, data taking because the uh, amount of uh, radiation due to the protons uh, is, 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 uh, is large enough so that we cannot, we cannot stay there. So let me just briefly explain to you what we do with an A62. There is a target of beryllium. The scale, you see the scale is in meters, the longitudinal scale, and the transfer scale is the meters as well, but here is plus minus two, and here is 250 meters. So this is because these cairns have a lot of momentum, uh, 75 GV in our units, which means they are boosted. And so they live a long time, they live 700 meters before the cairn in average, but so we content ourselves with just 10% of these cairns, which are the cairns. So they, the proton, primary proton come from the SPS machine and they strike a beryllium target. We select a secondary beam of 75 GV momentum. Uh, it's, pop, it's a big beam, huh? it's a beam which is 60 times 30 square millimeters. And you can see the beam here as it is seen by the pixel detectors. 
which are placed on the beam to do the tracking of every single secondary particle. The chaos is only six, are only 6%, so which means that uh, only 10% of them are usefully in a sense that they decay here before the detectors, and only 6% of the particles are chaos. So it's only one over 200 particles or so that are useful, but we have to track all of them. Um, the, the decay region is about 60 meter long. There's about five megahertz of K pluses, and the entire thing has to be kept under very good vacuum. Um, we have different detectors. This is a detector that is based on a differential Cherenkov of counter detector. It's able to give a response only when a K on of 75 GV passes through. If it is a different type of particle, like a pion or a uh, or a proton, the light emitted inside the medium has the wrong angle and is not detected. This is the pixel tracker, which goes through, um, which is uh, traversed by 750 megahertz of particles and they have all to be tracked. Then there are some counters. There are large angle vitas to surround the tank, making sure that photons don't escape. There are tracking detectors inside the tank. They have to sustain the, 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 the vacuum pressure. So there's a differential pressure of one bar there. There's ring image in Cherenkov counter, of which I have a picture later, the krypton calorimeter, uh, muon detectors, and a dump. Here you have a reference to the detector if you want more information. Let me just briefly go through now to the four main detectors. One is we call the giga tracker because it has to deal with about a, a gigahertz of particles. That's a beam. We had to invent this technology. This is silicon pixel with time resolution of 100 picosecond. And I think we could have uh, used it if we would not, I mean, we're a small group. I think that there would have been applications like uh, proton radiography and these type of things, because it's really, you can do real time tracking with this uh, kind of uh, gigahertz type of beam. But, uh, we couldn't, we, we didn't have the, we couldn't patent it because we spoke about it in, in conferences and then we were told that it was too late to patent it. But that was a great, a great, very great uh, um, development made for this experiment. And, it, and you see a station there, it has plenty of features, microchannel cooling to cool the sensor, very fast electronics, each fix, each line of pixels as, a, as, a, as like the equivalent of a, of a, of a TDC. So this was really great stuff. You see here the, the straw tracker before the installation. They were made, um, they are open. So these are gaseous chambers, but they are operated in a vacuum chamber. So they have to be leak tight and maintain the quality of the vacuum 10 to minus six. You see here one chamber before the installation. And I can tell is a lot of kilometers of tubes. These are mylar with the copper and, uh, and gold. And, um, and then they were made by ultrasound welding. And these are many tubes, more than 10,000 tubes. And they were all made by a single person, a single operator with a machine who checked and cut every tube and checked the, the quality of the tube. And um, uh, it's really looked like uh, Swiss watch making. There was a collaboration of CERN and, the, and GINR in doing. Now, this is the ring image in Cherenkov counter, which allows you to distinguish between the pion and the kaons. And it's basically like uh, the pions, the kaons, and the muons is meant for pi mu separation. And I was teasing people saying, well, don't worry if it doesn't work, the experiment. We can always use it as a Newtonian telescope of a 70 meter focal lens, great, great fast telescope. And um, in fact, uh, there are, the, it looks like a telescope, in fact, and this is the, where you, you, you see the light, and there's a big spherical mirror at the end, and it's, there's, it's full of neon, so that you have, a, you have a particular sensitivity to distinguish the particles measuring their velocities, which depends in the medium uh, by the, the momentum, and you measure the momentum using the straws and, uh, and the magnet, and so from that, you can determine the mass of the particle, understand which species it is. And this is a large photon vetoes to veto all the normal decays of, of the chaos in uh, by zeros, et cetera, and have a little story there. 
the little story is that uh, this glass, uh, we were looking how to make these wonderful vitos uh, and uh, big vitos for an experiment without spending too much. And then we bumped into these crystals well, that were used for the lab experiment, for the opal experiment at lab. And, and then when, when I saw them, I said to the Japanese who was in charge, I said, what are you going to do with those uh, crystals? And he said, nothing, we don't know what to do with them. Okay, then keep them because we have an excellent use in an A62. And then people took a lot of precautions to use this and to fashion them into a geometry that would be suitable for, for an A62, a fixed starlight experiment, while Opal was a, a collider experiment. Now I am getting very close to the result I want to share, share with you. And before showing you the result, I have to give you a little bit of a flavor of how the analysis is done. Now the analysis is done, first of all, we have to remember we have to kill all these normal processes, 20% of kaons decay into pions, more than 60% of kaons decay into a mu and a neutrino. So you can see here you have just one charge track if you make the mistake of thinking that the muon is a pion, and then that's it, you, have, you, have, you, can, you can make a mistake and you think you have a pion, instead you have a muon, so you have to be very careful. The three pions you have to veto, uh, the, the two pions, the electron and the neutrino, even if this is already much rarer, but that has also to be uh, vetoed, et cetera, et cetera. So basically what you see here, what, the, what we use, as a quantity to discriminate between the pi nu nu bar and the, and the other reactions is the momentum of the K plus, which is measured using the, um, the, the, the beam tracker, the giga tracker, and the pion, and the pion reconstructed by the strokes make uh, the square, and this is the missing mass recoiling against the charge track assumed to be a pi plus. And you see a distribution of the missing mass, which is here, as a function of the momentum. What is indicated here in this band in the middle is the background due to pi pi decays, where a pi zero is lost, is not seen, and you think you have one charged particle, and therefore it looks like the signal. But you can see it's a two-body decay, so it's well contained in this region. This other structure here is where is a mu nu, when you think you have got the pi plus and instead you have got the mu. And it looks distorted and outside the physical region of positive missing mass because you have made the error of thinking you had a pi plus instead you have a mu, which has a smaller mass. And then the big cuts are made. And here there are regions where this is the region where the three pions are. And these two regions, R1 and R2, is where there is less background and you can. Uh, so to say, hope to be able to see some, some signal there. Now, a trick of the experiment, there are many tricks, I'm not going through them. One is uh, that one restricts oneself to regions of low momentum for the pi plus. It's where a lot of energy goes away the pi, with the pi zero in case of a K to two pi on decay. And you have a good chance that with the krypton calorimeter and all the vetoes that you have, you can catch the pi zero, it cannot escape, and so you read all those things. That makes it feasible to study here and here. You can extend a bit there because this background is, is reasonably far away from there, while this one, it gets very close to the signal region. Uh, there's a time association and a space association. The rate is very different in different detectors. The beam, as I mentioned before, is a gigahertz of particles. And so there's a lot of pile up there. And um, in this here, the association is made looking at the requesting that the timing is the same for the tagger that tells you this is a kaon, eh, differential channel of counter, and the pixel detector. While you can have a lot of, if, if the particle is not a kaon, because kaon is only 6%, there's no correlation between, between the two, if the particle is in the tagger only accidentally. And the closest distance of approach, which is how close the two tracks get together. The, now I want to tell you something else of which uh, I, I, I think I think one should, know, should be open and explain things. And uh, there are surprises at times. I, I, there was a bug in the simulation of the experiment. Because basically, 
the, the, all the decays happening uh, before, yeah, the, 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 this, they were simulated if they starting from here and going down. But of course you have also, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. There was also decays that happened before because nobody tells decay on where it is. Now you can decay, it decays where it wants. So those were actually dangerous. And, uh, and the bug was that the collimator to stop them was uh, too small. So luckily we didn't find the bug before proposing the experiment because I'm afraid that otherwise we would have, we would have not dared to propose it because it could have been a potential showstopper. Now, having the, to deal with the bug and finding the reasons and correcting, in 2018, a new collimator was installed, suppressing significantly all these backgrounds due to these decays. So for these experiments, they are so, so to say, so focused on something and still you can have bugs, but luckily you, you can fix them. So this was, a, this was an interesting, this was to say that the analysis was really blind in the sense that we really didn't know what we were doing before adding the new collimator almost. Now, let me, let me now get, uh, try to write it, wrap it up. Um, there's a lot of sophisticated analysis. In this type of experiments where the background is 10 to the 11 times larger than the signal, you cannot rely on the simulations. You really need big chunk of data where you compare and you check that what you expect is what you have in the, in the, in the, in the data. What you expect from the simulation is what you have in the data and you measure without relying on the simulation. And here is where this photon veto, the krypton calorimeter comes in. It's not just a veto. It has to be able to reconstruct the K plus to by plus by zero without using information from the chambers, using information only from the two photons, fully reconstructed and the mass of the K. And then you can see you can reconstruct the missing mass without using information from the tracking. And you can actually go and measure in these regions how much you, you're expecting and then check that you have a good agreement with, with the data. This is fundamental for this type of measurements. So altogether, we were expecting about, uh, from the 2018 data, about um, eight events of signal and five events of background. These experiments are done blind in the sense that you don't look inside the signal regions, except for this, which is when you make orthogonal cuts. So that this is not a signal region, but it's a signal region where you actually ask that the pi zero is there. Yeah? And then you're ready to, you, you have a good descriptions of backgrounds, a good descriptions of uh, what is outside. You have to convince 200 people that you know, you, know enough what you, what you know enough what to do, and then you open the box. And this is the most recent result uh, by an A62 presented at ICHEP, the big conference in 2020. There are 17 events. You see here in gray is what you expect from the simulation. This box type of shape is because in different beams of momentum, the acceptance is not the same. And um, this is uh, shown here uh, with the data Monte Carlo comparison with absolute normalization, no, no, no adjustments to these things. You see very nice agreement. You see therefore uh, the three pi, you see the five pi, you see the mu nu, you see the signal sticking out there. Signal is the is the etched. You can divide it in uh, in different uh, in different uh, regions, beaming the data in momentum beams, and um, it's uh, it's very it's it's very clear the signal, and um, you see how it moves from one beam to the other, and this uh, leads to a result which is. Uh, shown here, this divided into various beans, the expected background, the expected observed the data, the new collimator, which is most of the data, the old collimator. And um, the result is 11. You remember that the prediction was eight. And so this is uh, still large errors that uh, will be become much smaller with the new data to be collected starting from 2021. It is a 3.5 standard deviation, sigma, signal, with the probability that all of this is background of only 2.2 uh, times 10 to minus one. And um, this is, uh, in a sense, uh, the last slide before, last two slides before the conclusions. It's been a long journey, looking, chasing, uh, <laughs> chasing this kind of decays. This is like chasing Moby Dick the whale, eh, in a sense. 
it's, I mean, it takes a really um, a manic um, approach. But uh, now you see that standard model theory is still uh, more precise than the experiments. So an ac 2 is not done yet uh, to see if there are tiny deflections, but it's been very rewarding to get, uh, you know, to invest um, the past uh, 10, 15 years to look for, for, for this decay. Um, in fact, uh, perhaps an A62 could go well beyond 10% measurement. Now it's 30% measurement. And that would require, however, to replace several detectors, and this would require a lot of uh, a lot of effort. And um, there are plans, but for the time being, nothing is is approved. And this is the conclusions. Uh, let me try to recap a little bit. So the strong chemical program continues. Hopefully, we'll continue to add pieces to the standard model. Uh, we are moving from exploration to precision in rare candy case. The short-term goal is by 2025 to reach a 10% measurement of uh, K plus to pi plus nu nu bar in A62. There's a sister experiment in Japan looking for the corresponding K0 long decay. Uh, that will require a bit more time to, to get to the standard model. Longer term goals. And then of course, there are other compelling investigations for lepton universality violation, lepton number violation, exotic decays, heavy neutral leptons. And for all those things, there's, there are a few more slides that you can browse with references in case of interest or questions. And with this, I, I stop and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Augusto. Thank you very much, Augusto. So may I start with questions and maybe then give the floor to the rest? Is it okay? So being a teacher now, I have started, I have changed my mind in the sense of what attracts me more. So listening to you, it was really great, but I was trying to think, okay, if I want to speak with my students about chaos, because we have, a, for example, a small club uh, with a sm really small 11, 12 years old students. So if I want to introduce this uh, interesting subject to them, uh, can you tell me what I could uh, give us, what I could tell them in order to, to make them more interesting on it? For example, uh, what, is, what is it special about counts? Uh, so searching for them, uh, what uh, does it add to the picture that we already know? So is it something that... that... Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the thing is, for instance, uh, there's a big question, and the big question is, we know that we need CP violation in order to understand the matter, antimatter and balance in the universe, but we know mm -hmm. that this CP violation we have measured so far is not enough. So we have to keep checking now concerning the quarks, uh, the amount of CP violation in the, in the system is parameterized by a number which is called J. J stands for Jarskog, who is a mm -hmm. physicist, a lady physicist from Sweden, who uh, figured it out that basically no matter how you study things in the standard model, there's always this J. Now, suppose that you study J extremely well from B physics, for instance, and you can see here the standard model, you call it the standard model, and it's something that uh, in some units is three point anything. Now, you you study k so that you can calculate J using a different system and then check that the J that comes out is the same. If it's not the same, perhaps you're actually looking for something which is uh, rather interesting. And as you can see, limits mm -hmm. in, from k are still far away from uh, the uh, standard model. Let's call it standard model global theory. Now, admittedly, uh, the, the chance that you find uh, something thoroughly different uh, well, you know, uh, if you don't test it, you don't know. And the uh, kaons have the advantage of having very clean theory. So the, the kaon is nice because in principle, it's purely an experimental problem, while it's not always the case in other systems. Then, you know, from there, you can say mm -hmm. kaons and the weak interactions, you connect to neutrinos, people are looking for CP violation in neutrinos, CP violation in other quark systems like the B, the D, et cetera. So this is the, so to say, the catchy is the matter and the matter thing. 
more technically is really test stress in the standard model to the to the to the, you know, to, to the limit. And of course, in all these, there's always the interaction of the Higgs with the, with the giving, giving mass to, to the quarks. And so uh, the, the kaon is a mid, mid between the, you know, the heavy quarks and the, and the light quarks. So testing the quark allows you to test the phenomenology on the field. This is the, I mean, I have tried in my presentation to give you the professional view. Uh, of, uh, of but but indeed you know the if you have to speak to people and entice people to why they should be studying kaons then you have to use a little bit of uh, enticement so as many people talk mm -hmm. about you know the, the heavy ions then it's the big bang these things the higgs is to give the mass even if it just gives a tiny little one percent mass with respect to the mass of the hadrons and here is the mm -hmm. here's the bigger picture of uh, matter antimatter and uh, and in general uh, uh, mixing and and of the quarks. Very nice. Thanks a lot. So, are there any other questions? I'm sure you do have. I I have a question, Eleni. Can yes. you hear me? Go yeah. ahead. I'm a bit afraid because it's really a, lay, a lay, layman question. I'll say uh, very naive, but never mind. You know, I, I go, uh, Augusto. You say that the, the problem with particle physics today that if you want to do something that is not general purpose, then you you hit some problems. C can you elaborate on that? Because I interpreted it as. Uh, perhaps hindering science to go in all corners where, where it should. So if you could say a bit more. Well, I, I, I mentioned that in a sense that there are not very many subjects that you can study um, specifically. So you have the muons, you have the neutrinos, you have the kaons, but uh, you have seen an A62 and A62 is not a small experiment and uh, it requires a lot of resources, people, etc. And so it's not completely obvious that you, uh, you have um, you certainly taken, for an A62 it has taken, you see, from conception of the experiment and then um, going through committees, gathering the people, getting the means, building the detector, checking that works, getting the beam, analyze the data, get the publication, and it took 15 years. This is a big investment. You need really people who, are, who have the possibility to invest and uh, uh, ideas and uh, the it's um, particle physics is a big endeavor and uh, there's to learn something new you need uh, significant investments so the particle physics as we know it is colliders if you have colliders then you can think about experiments like an a62 which is using the injector of the collider but uh, it would be difficult if you had to do a particle physics program just with, just so to say, you know, without a collider. Once you have a collider, then all the money goes there because uh, it's such a big thing. And also the sociology is different. You know, we are 200 people. It's called a small experiment. I mean, think about it. <laughs> it's a huge experiment, but it's called small and medium, small. The, the, this, you know, the, the, the thing is, um, the, the you have to convince people that what you propose makes sense and that there's no, no, not too much risk. But risk, if there's no risk, most likely the return is very small. So there should be, there should be room for their devils who are ready to put their scientific credibility at stake, taking some risk. I hope it will continue to be the case. Thank you, Gusto. Lenny, hi, Michele speaking. May I ask a question? Sure, Michele, go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to uh, the speaker. Uh, the experiment is uh, uh, very complicated. Uh, 
for the result that uh, they have achieved. Uh, just a naive question. How, from the standard model the point of view, you can explain the oscillation of the K0, K0 bar? They coincide. They have the same mass. Yeah. The, 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 it's a very good question. So K0 and K0 bar have the same mass. In fact, what is oscillating is the, the neutral chaos. So what, uh, what the, the weak interaction is such that uh, the, the two eigenstates are a long-lived and a short-lived one. So indeed, one has a strange. Uh, both are a mix of strange and anti-strange. Then, of course, to go from a, from a, from a strange to anti-strange, you need second order weak interaction. So this, you need this type of diagrams, like uh, the, the box diagram here. And instead of leptons in the final state, you would have um, uh, an SD, uh, yeah, you would have an exchange of quark, UCT also on this side, and then you would have a D and a S. So this would be the type of diagram necessary to make the, the oscillation. So you would start from a K0, and go to a K0 bar. And the point is exactly that. I mean, this is, you know, is there something in these loops that we don't know yet? Is there something, you know, uh, that we don't directly produce uh, colliders because they, there's not enough energy in the collider that would like a fourth generation of quarks, a T prime, or, or a new generation of, of, of a gauge boson, like a Z prime, that, you know, these are vi virtual, these graphs. You start from a real particle, you end up with a real particle, but inside here you have virtual particles. And uh, there are contributions from, from all the discovered particles, like the top quark. But if there is a T prime quark, that also will contribute at some level given that in the theory prediction the t prime is not there there should be a disagreement between theory and experiment and to check those things of course one has to go to much more precise measurements is there room to uh, make the hypothesis that there are some hidden variables in the process you mean hidden variables in the quantum mechanical term yeah yeah the with the chaos, well, another beauty I, which I did not speak at all, yeah, is the is the fact that chaos basically, and this this was really the phenomenology of the chaos in the sixties, they behave like uh, uh, like quantum mechanics in the lab over over meters. So, for instance, the interference of these particles, you can have a uh, you, suppose you have uh, you prepare your beam having more K zero, a pure K zero beam, for instance. And, uh, and, and then you, you, you make them and you let them go into your lab. And then you can really see the interference pattern of this. So you have over meters a figure of a, figure of a, a picture of interference that lasts for meters and uh, provides, of course, very, very good tests of quantum mechanics. So the, the, the hidden variables in this sense, uh, I. Uh, I, I, you, you probably would, you would like to refer to the, to the EPR tests. Yes. Uh, and then there will be, then you should look, some experiments have been made with chaos, beautiful experiments of, of quantum interferometry using chaos, which is a very special use. You, you make, for instance, this was done using a five factor in Frascati. The idea is to use a, a E plus E minus collision to produce a phi meson. The phi meson decays in a pair, an entangled pair of K0 short and K0 long. And then given that the phi has a specific quantum numbers, there's a beautiful, uh, the entanglement is such that if, uh, if the short, let's take the short particle decays in a pi pi on uh, one hemisphere of the detector, because of, because of the statistics, the other kaon 
cannot decay at exactly the same proper time on the other side in two piles, because that would violate statistics. As if, of course, the kaon, how does he know that the other kaon has decayed, etc.? And the only answer I know is that uh, is, is, a, is, a, is the thing is an entangled quantum state, thoroughly. And um, you should have a look at what has been done with those uh, measurements in Frascati to yeah, but this has been also, uh, this measurement has been repeated with the, the B factories in uh, Japan, if I am not wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. <clears throat> if there are no more questions, I do have one myself, actually. So, um, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. All oh, right. Yeah, sorry. I thought I was muted. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a, a bit more technical question. So I think in such a complex uh, experiment, the source of errors are multiple, right? And I was wondering uh, what is the main source, uh, the main contributor to the um, systematic error, for example? Yeah. So far, there's not much systematic error in the sense that uh, the, the the experiment is limited by the statistics, but I will tell you yeah. what the uh, systematic is. Um, you see the statistical error is uh, four in these units and statistic systematic is mostly related to the flux of chaos and trigger efficiency. We okay. didn't insist much on that for yeah. the moment. Yeah. But uh, th this kind of experiments, of course, presume that you have backgrounds under control. Yeah. Like, for instance, if I take the table with the backgrounds, where the backgrounds are listed, this yeah. upstream background of three is larger than any other background. And to keep it at that level has required a lot of acceptance cuts. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the figure of merit of the experiment would be the acceptance and the signal of a background. And to keep it at the acceptable level, this uh, kind of background, we had to make significant, significant cuts in the acceptance. Now, uh, once you have understood it, then the, for the next run in 2021, new anti-counters will be installed in the region, catching those decays. And hopefully this upstream background, which is the more annoying part of the background, will be significantly reduced. Yeah. So even if it is not reflected in the systematics, from a point of view of a figure of merit, I would say this is the, the largest, the most annoying part for the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you mentioned also some plans for 2021 for some uh, um, data run, I guess. And so, so what is the, the future then uh, for this experiment? Right. So the, now one has to arrive to a kind of a 10% measurement. Yeah. And that should be achieved by the end of uh, run three of the LHC. So the, the, uh, the 2024, 2025. Mm -hmm. To go further, because in principle, the theory will be improved because there's, there's going to be a lot of measurements by LHCB. The, the error on the theory is not really theoretical. It's the precision of the standard model fit in a sense, the standard model parameters. Mm -hmm. and they're going to be improved by LHCB, Bell 2. So in principle, one would, could go, try to go farther, but that would require um, to uh, replace the tracker, which mm -hmm. is now the limiting factor, 65 picosecond time resolution. We, one would need to go to something like 15 or 20 picoseconds. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is a technology that hopefully may become available, but is not being pursued by, by us now. We don't have the, the, the strength to do that. And then a new thinner chamber for which we have some tests going to straws of a material of 12 micron uh, thickness instead of 36 and making smaller straws, but this is just uh, being developed. And that would of course require significant effort again. And uh, you know, the, the, usual, the usual struggle with scientific committees and- uh, Yeah, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> you know, it's so much easier for people just to piggyback on large experiments. And, yeah, yeah. Why, you know, why, why would I invest 10 years of my life? You know, a younger person would come to me and say, well, what, I mean, Should I understand be, what you do, what you do is fine, but 
why should I sacrifice myself for 10 years and then not get a job because I am in this corner of things? So I would say, yes, is uh, you must be crazy. But uh, luckily, there are still crazy people. You see, uh, <laughs> I think it's endemic in society. Some people are not just happy to just do what the other do. Yeah, a little bit of craziness is good. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You know, not too much, but a little bit. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Augusto. So I think this draws us, uh, this draws this event to an end. Um, thank you also to um, Elini and Giordano for the moderation. Um, now, maybe you'd like to move on to the next event, which CERN alumni have been also invited to. There's a webcast of our Galactic Center, a unique laboratory for the physics and astrophysics of black holes. And this is with the Nobel Prize 2020 winner for physics. So you can see that in the chat, um, I've shared the, the link to the webcast and also details of, of the event. But before we move on to um, that next event, I, it'd be nice if we could all give Augusto a huge round of applause. You can use the little reactions if you like and put a, put a re reaction in. Um, thank you so much. And perhaps Augusto, it's okay for people to reach out to you if they've got questions that we haven't had time to look at today. <clears throat> Absolutely. With great pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And we look forward to having a guided tour uh, when we do the al uh, alumni collisions. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank and you. have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for yeah, joining you. us.